this is kind of quiche and we have all the time. And we all play Black History all the time. So, um, you know, we are here in ongoing celebration and recognition together, not only of our history as black people, but our, our history together here as humanity, working it out together. Good morning. Welcome to our Black History Month Convocation. My name is Javon Robinson. I'm a senior biology major here at Carleton. And this morning, I have the honor to introduce our Black History Month Convocation speaker, Commissioner Tony Carter. While completing research, <laughs> while completing research in our college's archives for an upcoming exhibit, I came across photos from the 1970s depicting the life of black students living in Hill House. Although a picture could tell a thousand words, there was still so much more about the black student experience at Carleton that could not be archived. And so I'm excited today to hear Commissioner Carter recant some of those stories and share how her experiences here as a student influenced her work in education, the arts, and community building. Commissioner Carter made history becoming the first African American to ever serve on a county board in Minnesota. Committed to the delivery of efficient and effective county services, eliminating disparities in the county services and systems, and raising grassroots awareness of county decision making processes, Commissioner Carter has led several Ramsey County system changes and efforts. One of these efforts is the Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative as a part of the juvenile justice reform that has reduced the number of youth held at the Ramsey County Juvenile Detention Center and increased system and community alternatives for low risk use. Prior to her election to the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners, Tony Carter served as a member and chair of the St. Paul Board of Education. Active in the community building, for 30 years, Commissioner Carter has served on numerous, as on numerous community boards, including the St. Paul Planning Commission, the Metropolitan Area Library Service Agency, the Walker West Music Academy, the West Side Community Health Center, and the St. Paul YMCA. Today, Commissioner Carter remains engaged with school and community and intergovernmental partners in strategic collaboratives for child safety, student achievement, and youth development, including through the St. Paul's Children's Collaborative and the St. Paul Promise Neighborhood. A member of Governor Walt's Children's Cabinet Advisory, she continues to work with statewide stakeholders to ensure comprehensive support for children and families. She has also participated in leading impl the implementation of regional area leadership workforce participation through the Greater Metropolitan Workforce. Please help me welcome back Commissioner Tony Carl uh, Carter to Carlton College. It is a joy to be here today. And I have to apologize to Javon for jumping the mic and being here. I was um, on the road, not speeding, but driving aggressively to get here on time. Uh, it was a little dusty out there this morning. Nevertheless, it was a safe drive. I'm glad to be here and to see all of you on this occasion of Black History Month Convocation. I appreciate being invited back. I don't get back to this campus often enough. And it is a place where I have so many memories, both fun and difficult. Uh, so I'm glad to be here, to be in this space, to see all of you, and to be able to reflect 
on some of those memories in the context of the life I've lived in the Twin Cities area here in Minnesota, my family and community, and the work that I currently do as commissioner on the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners for the district elected out of District 4, which is largely, which is St. Paul, about a quarter of St. Paul, actually. Uh, it encompasses the area around I-94 between the river of Minneapolis and the capital. It encompasses that area of University Avenue, where since 2014, we have been able to have the first light rail line for the East Metro area, connected, of course, uh, to the line in Minneapolis that leads southward. I have been delighted in the work that I've chosen to do these past 20 years as an elected official. Three and a half of them spent at the St. Paul School Board, which was a natural evolution of my becoming, having been here at Carleton College and in the teacher education program. I continued to enjoy the process of educating young people, including my own, becoming a teacher for a while, before joining the St. Paul School Board for a while, and then before running for the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners, where I have served since 2005. I have to tell you that coming to Carleton College may not have been the most natural evolution of who I was at the time when I came a 16-year-old from the Huff area in Cleveland, Ohio, which I would not have been, but would probably reflecting based on academic studies and current events and things of that sort, as an urban ghetto at the time. Having attended primarily gifted and talented programs early in my life being plucked out of my neighborhood school and having attended major work and enrichment accelerated programs. But then, then deciding after that period of riots and being locked up in the cafeteria at Collinwood Junior High School that I really needed to return home. So going back to that area, University of Euclid in Cleveland and attending high school at John Hay, which was an all black high school, and deciding after getting there, hmm, you know what, I probably could leave a year early. I was enjoying myself, but I'd taken all those courses. So coming to Carleton, at 16. I tell you, at Carleton, I found friendships, relationships that I continue to value, appreciate, and to call on today in my life. I have a question. Is the old Norse basement still haunted? Well, it was at Norse, where I lived in my first year, that those relationships and friendships began. And I would have called on a friend to come with me today, my bestie, Benice Young, were it not for the fact that she's in recuperation from an operation, and she could not come and join us here. But we continue based here at Carleton to reinforce our friendship and relationship in ways that have helped both of us, I hope, to grow through the years and reflecting back on Norris, even this chapel, inspirational movement, 
was our choir. And I sure hope that there are some pictures of in inspirational movement in this exhibit that is coming up today because it was excellent. Oh yeah, we rivaled Sounds of Blackness any day with our director, Michael Monroe, who I can still see standing here for those Sunday chapel songs that we would sing. And it brought kind of a different sense to this chapel. Our voices ringing out, or some might say pounding out, from this area and introducing Northfield and Carleton College to gospel music was just the most delightful thing for me and for those members of Inspirational Movement with whom I sang. I was a soprano back then, <laughs> I couldn't do it today. And I do remember joy, 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 the joy that we had here at Carleton. I mentioned that Old Norse was haunted back then. I wonder if it is still today. But down in Old Norse, down in that basement, we discovered the Old Norse Theater. And did you know that the Black Ensemble, the Black Theater Ensemble, produced a number of plays back in my day in the Old Norse Theater? Is it still up and running and used for small theater? You know, I'm not really sure that we were confined to that theater, but we did have productions there. I don't recall going out of that theater into other theater spaces back then. I'm not sure why. It felt right. You know, we were there as family and community. I don't know that we were giving our best service to the entire college because I don't remember that we actually had an audience that we drew from the entire college at that time, but the productions were incredible. Anybody back from that day recall those productions in Old Norse Theater? I hope so. All right, thank you for joining us and being a part of our community. Do you remember Fred Easter? I do, yes. And Fred introduced us to the A Better Chance program, which was an opportunity for young black students, young students of color. Most of them were black, as I recall. And I remember Fred and Leroy Jones who came and plucked me out of John Hay High School in Cleveland, Ohio. You see, they were actively recruiting for diverse students at that time. And they came to my hometown and they met with me. I interviewed and the next thing I knew I was on a plane coming out to Northfield, Minnesota from Cleveland, Ohio. It was a bit strange, but it was springtime they knew when to bring us out. And we had a ball. Upperclassmen hosted us throughout the weekend, carried us through the college, introduced us to the environment, the natural environment, to the professors, to people in the community. It was a very, very interesting black weekend in the middle of this white university that made me feel embraced and welcomed. Still just a little bit strange. It was the time, I believe, during which Carleton had the most diverse community ever. And I think the investment in sharing with us that intensely cultural time on this campus was an investment in acknowledging that we needed to be surrounded by familiar faces, that we needed to be embraced by that cultural connection, fed, nourished, and exposed 
opposed to an environment that would nurture us with a broader community and that would assist us in our walks into the world. It was an investment in getting to know us better and in wishing that we too would get to know the Carleton community better. So I remember Leroy Jones, I remember Fred Easter. You know who else I remember? Oh yeah, sure do. I remember Paul Wellstone. But I also remember Dean Jean. Does anybody remember Dean Jean? Let me tell you what I remember about Dean Jean. She would pull you in. She looked for you and she would find you. And she did her best to embrace you. Dean Jean, to my knowledge, was a European American woman who understood her role of reaching out, of embracing, of introducing and elevating. Anybody remember the mortar board? The mortar board was a distinguished organization of women. Does it still exist here at Carleton? Anybody on the mortar board? I was invited to be on the mortar board by Dean Jean. Oh, that was cool. And she brought me in and she introduced me to the other members of the mortar board. And at the end of that semester, in my junior year, I left Carleton. You know, that semester was following the year in which I went on an international trip with Michel Monod, who was a French professor here, and who had also understood his role of drawing in and embracing and supporting and introducing and lifting. I had seen a bigger part of the world. I had been introduced to negritude, similar to Pan-Africanism, but in a other world context, negritude helped me to understand the broad connection of African people across the world. And in a very unique way, because you see, I was a French student. And so going to France, I had not been expecting to be introduced to African culture, such as I was, but I found a community of African students and learned about literature and countries and culture and about our connection across the seas to each other as African people through the struggle that was so common for all of us. I had also, coming back to Carleton then, because, you know, when you get to know yourself a little bit better, you also want to get to know others better, and you're more open to the world and to building community with others. So I had tried out for a play and got a role. I think it was Anything Goes. Is that the one where you kick your legs up? And that? Yeah. Okay. So I was on the course line. That was kind of cool. Because, you know, back then they didn't really mix dark and light skin or chorus lines. You know, that was just not really done. But I got a role. And so it was a bigger environment. It was a bigger audience opportunity. It was a bigger production. You know, lots of, lots of resources had been brought to bear for that production of Anything Goes. And, you know, that year, with all of the testing that I was doing here at Carleton to connect to the broader community, to be a part of this broader university, that year was the year that I began to question whether I belonged here. And I can't quite explain it. You know, I know all the work that was happening to engage me, to embrace me, to help lift me. I know that learning more about myself 
made me want to and made me more receptive to learning more about the college and about others. But for some reason, my consciousness in that year took me away from here. In that year, that year of becoming, I did learn a lot from Carlton. The relationships, the rigor, I should tell you that I was tops in my class at John Hay High School in Cleveland, Ohio. Guess what? When I got to Carleton, that changed. <laughs> I'm not so sure why, but all of a sudden I was struggling with my first freshman year courses, calculus, history, literature, economics, I forget what else. But you know, I put them all together, that first freshman semester here at Carleton, and it was a big mistake. Like I said, I learned about rigor. I also learned through my relationships about teamwork and cooperation, and through those who reached out to me, professors, about helping others and about that willingness to work together. You know that we actually could become an important part of each other's lives. So I learned a lot at Carleton, the rigor, the relationships. I also gained the reference. And I gotta tell you, whether I left Carleton in that third year or not, was not an issue for me because people heard Carleton on my resume and they were like, come over here. <laughs> it did me some good. And when I applied to work for the IBM Corporation, not yet having finished, they brought me in and I spent 13 years as a systems engineer, a marketing representative, a marketing and systems manager at the IBM Corporation, leaving only because I didn't see my role models there. I really could not see my future in that context. And it helped me with the house and the fence and the dog and the cars and to raise a family, at least to begin raising a family. And I haven't gotten to any slides yet, have I? So I probably should share that family. Here they are. Since leaving Carleton, this is some of what I've been blessed with. You'll see my family at the top there with my husband, together with me, taking the vow as a county commissioner in Ramsey County and surrounded by children and friends and family. Oh, by the way, that picture, that other picture is me when I came to Carleton. So from those beginnings and here at Carleton, you'll also see at the bottom, grandchildren and my entire family now, minus one, a new baby born a couple years ago who didn't get into that picture, but that's my lovely family. My husband, again, is holding the Bible for me at the top and he's also at the right, at the bottom. And I and my son are standing in front of the flag at Ramsey County in the courthouse where I serve as a county commissioner and he serves as mayor. Blessed for the opportunities, thank you, that have been afforded to me based on the rigor and the relationships and also the reference of Carleton College. I live in the Twin Cities in St. Paul. That is where Ramsey County is, of course. And you know that the county I live in is the smallest and the most densely populated, and it is also the most diversely populated of counties in Minnesota. We've got to get it right in Ramsey County if we are to be a prosperous community, if we are to thrive, we must get it right for everyone. We are quickly 
becoming one of the counties where more languages are spoken than Minnesota, over 100 languages. We also happen to have a very large population of young people. Yes, including young people who have joined us from many diverse countries and who speak those many different languages that I talked about. We have a high concentration, too, of poverty, with over 25% of those young people living in high poverty households. It is not a coincidence that we are largely people of color and we have such high poverty. I do not have to give you that lesson because I know that you know the circumstances of disparity that in Minnesota, which is the Minnesota miracle, the circumstances of disparities and disproportionalities that exist for people of color, whether it be in terms of poverty or owning their own homes, or in terms of the level of education that they are able to achieve and academic readiness to go to college, or even in terms of the justice system and the ability to live healthy and free without engagement ongoing and repetitive in our justice system. So I don't have to tell you the impact that that has had on people in my county or across the state, across the country, or across the world. But what I do have to tell you is that in Ramsey County, we are using rigor and our relationships and our reference to move our county forward. The work that we are doing, the examples that we are setting, the work with our community and focused on equity that we are doing, I hope, will lead us to the better future that we all want for all of us. Within our area, we have done a lot to change our systems, and we continue to do a lot to change those systems. It's not unsimilar to what you're going through here at Carleton. You know, understanding all of our good intents, you know, do not achieve the outcomes that we have desired for all of us. We are wrapping our heads around the research. We are wrapping our heads around the information and data. We are wrapping our heads around the strategies and best practices that are being employed, some in other parts of the country or world, that we can adopt here and inventing those which have not been tried, that we have the obligation to try. I'm showing you a pie here, and I don't think you can necessarily read this, but this pie is of the values that we've established in our county and that we embrace as we do the work for people as our greatest asset, whether they be people working for us in the county or in our community working with us. That's our highest asset. Our value for leadership and creating what works, not just doing what our organization has done all our lives, but understanding the outcomes and leading to change systems in order to address those outcomes that we want for people. Working with people with integrity and with a focus, as I said before, on equity. We've changed our systems. We've developed a vision of a vibrant community where all are valued and thrive. So that's a Carleton where all of your students can receive from this rich environment all that it offers, where the outcomes show that here at Carleton in terms of the achievement of those students and in Ramsey County in terms of the vitality of those families. Working together, that vibrant community where all are valued and thrive is our vision. And I'm glad to have been able to create that vision in Ramsey County because I truly believe, as many of you may, that where there is no vision, the people perish. That's our vision. 
And we were able to tie, once we had that vision, you know, which actually only happened uh, maybe eight years ago, because we had a mission, which was to be a county of excellence working together for all of us. That was our mission. But we had to figure out what we were doing and why. And it was so that all would truly be valued and thrive. So once we had that mission, then we could move toward the goals that we developed according to that mission to ensure that every family, individual, and our entire community would be strengthened through health and safety and well-being. That is our goal, to make certain that we were able to invest even in those areas that had typically and historically not been invested in to ensure the economic prosperity of all. So our economic development framework now focuses on those areas as primary areas for investment. We used to call them R caps, racially concentrated areas of poverty. I call them R caps, real catalyst areas for prosperity. Also enhancing the opportunity for everyone within our county, you know, that was a part of that light rail, making certain people could get to jobs, to work, to even fun, visiting friends and neighbors, making certain that mobility for people to get around, you know, to get to school, to do the things that they need in their lives exist, and not just physical mobility, but mobility to move between those opportunities that can work to guarantee prosperity. And then finally, being responsible for all of our resources, for all of those financial resources from our taxpayers, from the government, from other entities that help to support our work, our well-managed, transparent, and accountable. Now, this wheel is about our strategic priorities. And I know, because I've been watching from the outside, that Carlton's been going through and looking at its own strategic work and engaging the community, and that's how you do it, right? If you want to build a healthy community, you can't do it for the community. You have to do it with the community. So all of those voices that apply have to be at the table and powerful. It's not just about engagement, it's about sharing power. And so we had to reorganize our entire organization around those people that we serve, the people in our community, and bring those folks into focus in the middle, not just to work for them, but to work with them. So the various areas of work that we do are around this wheel. One I'll note and point out to you, just because it's important, is that we actually have our corrections department, which is the department that serves for youth and adults to provide consequences for offending in our community. We relocated it out of the public safety framework and put it into our health and wellness service team. Thank you. Somebody gets that, right? And so if our goal is that all are valued and thrive, we really have to get to the gut of this and understand the impact of the histories that we've lived out together in this country, in this state, in our county, that have not led to the inclusion in that opportunity for all. So if our goal is that all are valued and thrive or our vision, and our goal is to create that health and wellness and opportunity and prosperity for all, to be accountable for all the resources that we have, then we have to look at it from a safety perspective, yes, being safe and healthy and well for all, but also from a perspective of resourcing those individuals for whom that trajectory has not yet developed. And not just them, but understanding them within the context of their families and their communities. That's what that investment is about. And so placing that in that area of health and wellness was intended to help us make that investment. All my life, 
You know, here at Carleton, with those people that I mentioned already and others, I have been trained to look at the need in community, whether it's from a health and wellness perspective or from an arts perspective and using the arts to engage in health and wellness focus, to plan and to work together with others for that health and wellness. And that is what I, along with a engaged board of commissioners, staff, and community continue to do. This circle represents our community priority for criminal justice reform, and those acronyms are some of the programs that we have developed that are integrated into our work, and they stand for Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. And if you read the paper today, you'll hear people talking about the fact that there's so much crime now, and that juveniles are committing a large part of that crime. I call them young people, by the way, and that those young people are repeating some of their crimes, and that is true. There is so much inordinate level of crime throughout the country right now in response to pandemic, in response to the social justice and racial justice reckoning that is happening across our county, across our country, and across the world. And there is an elevated activity of offenses, certain offenses happening right now, and we need to focus together and pay attention to that. But we also need to recognize the context of long-term transformation. And that says you test, you do, you figure out what works, and you don't turn around because of a blimp in time. You know, you develop new solutions, but you continue the strategies that tend to work to help young people grow, to help them grow beyond, and they do, traje trajectories of crime, and to ensure that at the same time the community is safe. And so you'll hear about some of that work. CJCC is our Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee. I like to call it Community Justice Coordinating Committee. And TST is our transforming systems together, which now wraps around all of the work that we do at our county. Just a mention of that. These other slides I usually use when I'm talking a lot about the work that we've done at our county. They do address priorities that we continue to focus on within our county. Let me stop on this one. I, as a member of the Board of Commissioners, I serve to make decisions on a weekly basis about policy and financial aspects of our county, funding and support of programs. And when I make those decisions, I need good information. All of us do. I learned that at Carleton. Research is important. Information and data and testimony. And so when I make decisions on the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners and as chair over the past couple of years, I've requested to know what is the impact of this decision on racial groups to understand how this particular decision will impact racial equity. So our decision form, which is called our request for board action, has a place where each department making a request has to tell me that. You know, and more and more they are becoming avid at doing that at identifying how our decisions impact racial equity and making that a part of every decision that we make. I also want to know what has the community said? Who talked to the community? And so, as you do here, as I make decisions, I want to know what kind of community participation was there. And it's not always the community making the decisions. Sometimes it's just telling them what's happening, right? But I want to know what did we do? So as a part of building a healthy community, I work together with my commissioners, board and staff, and community to ensure that that type of information is there. Now you all know that over the past couple of years, it's been really tough, and that we have been engaged in pandemic response. And the county, making sure that people eat, have a place to stay, when they lose their jobs, that there is some opportunity to support them and their families financially, that we are able to connect them to new training because the jobs they had are gone and they now need new ones. 
and understanding that pathway that will get them to a livable wage job that will help to support their families, all of that has been critical and important. But of course, the health aspects of this pandemic have also primarily engaged the county. So I just want you to know, you know, counties have been involved in that testing, making sure people are tested, making certain that we understood early on the mitigation methods and then changed them as it was needed to do, masking, providing masks, making certain that people are now being vaccinated. All of that's been county work. You know, and I talk about the investments that we've received from the federal government as help during trying times, much needed. A large part of that investment went to housing. As so many people were homeless in our cities over the past couple of years, we had to make certain people had a place to stay, either shelter, and now as we work through the pandemic, looking to make certain that people who are low income and who are not able to afford their lives are able to find permanent housing and even the opportunity to own homes. So we just invested together with the city of St. Paul. I was so glad to be able to make that decision. $37 million to create 1,000 homes matched by 37.5 from the city of St. Paul so that we could aggregate our support to ensure that people have places to stay. But it's not enough. We have 15,000 a need for 15,000 units of housing for people in Ramsey County. We'll probably be able to build 1,000 together, help. So big federal resources have helped us at a time of dire need, and we all need to continue to work together to advocate for the resources that we will continue to need. I am going to slip through, not knowing exactly what time it is, but hoping somebody will give me the cue. I do want to focus before I tell the story about working with Paul Wellstone and his influence on me. I do want to focus on the fact that this has been a trying time of racial reckoning. And even yesterday, we were dealing with, in my community, the impacts of another occurrence of a Twin Cities African American man being shot and killed by police. And of course, all the facts are not yet known. But it is incredible that we continue to be an epicenter for this racial justice reckoning that is occurring today, hundreds of years late, but is occurring today in our communities. And we will all be impacted by the occurrences that have come to, to be centered in our lives at such a time as this. Even more so, we will all remember our placement in this reckoning and the decisions that we have individually and collectively made to help us move beyond this point and to a next where we all see a brighter future together. I spoke about, and I'm gonna skip over some slides, you know, I think I shared with you that in Ramsey County, we have a focus now on investment in economic prosperity for areas that have typically been uninvested in, such as the Rondo community. You might hear a lot about that community. That's in my district. You know, that's where I-94 came through and destroyed an economic engine for an African-American community. That has never replaced itself. And as we think about rebuilding I-94 in the next 10 years or so, the community is discussing together with our county and the state and the federal government how to do that in such a way as to reinvest in that economic engine for the community. Our plan in Ramsey County centers that type of reinvestment as a focus on equity, whether it be for jobs or for businesses or for housing, or for equitable development, including those who can be involved but have not yet been included in that development arena from communities of color. I just stop on that. This is an indication that we all need to partner together to assure that we're able to accomplish the healthy communities that we need and a focus on how we do that, because that is important. Partnering 
is not a thing. Partnering is a verb, and it's about acting in such a way that recognizes those with whom we work are broader than the circle that we typically have in our immediate command. It's looking out, it's reaching out, it's engaging new. It also means that we can't always take the credit. You know, there are so many from whom we are learning and with whom we are developing and to whom that credit is due. We also have to, as we're working together, know that we're gonna meet various and difficult trials. Focus on celebrating the achievements that day to day we make together and building and continuing to build more. Um, this is just the statue that is in the Ramsey County Courthouse that looks out upon all of us, that ensures that in the spirit of humanity, we are working together, at least reminds us to do so. I experienced Carleton during the Vietnam War. You know, that was an incredible time for all of us and for some of the students that came to Carleton instead of going to the war and then had to leave because of the draft. Um, that was an incredible time. Also, reflecting back of social justice reckoning. And we had the honor of being led by an incredible social justice champion, Paul Wellstone, who became Senator Paul Wellstone, who actually had a staff person call me on the night that he took that dreadful plane ride. And I had the opportunity to be among those who would serve as a surrogate for him when he could not be available at a local event. I have to tell you that evening I said, no, I got to do something else. I don't know why, but I didn't go that evening. And of course, the news that came after that was devastating and dreadful for us all. My Paul Wellstone story is about having dropped his class because I had too much going on you know, that semester. Having dropped his class, but continued to be a fan of his and I recall a trip that we took to the south, and it was to the area of my origin, actually to Columbus, Mississippi. I'm from Alabama, my family is from Alabama, and Columbus and Alabama are right like that. And I have relatives in Columbus and had at the time, only I didn't know it because I didn't tell my mother and my father until I was there. With Paul, with Paul's influence, and having been on that trip and having met people in Mississippi who were afraid to vote, who were afraid to engage, and this in the early 1970s because of the fear of what could happen to them, having been on a bus and been stopped by the police because we were a bus of African-American and white students and faculty and staff. Having been questioned at that time and fearful of my own life, after which I called my mother and told her where I was and she said, you're where? She was afraid for me. But having been led and taught and understanding that each one of us has to take a step forward in order for all of us to advance. By that man, Paul Wellstone, I continued to connect to him through the years. And even on the school board in St. Paul, to use him, to call upon him as a mentor and a friend. And I, like you, if you knew him or knew of him, miss him tremendously. But I think Paul had a lot to do with my own reckoning, with my own development of a sense of justice, and with my own ambitions to be an ambassador in the world. 
and with my own ability to recognize that right where I stand in Ramsey County with the diverse community that I have and with the great needs that each of us has to ensure wellness and prosperity for all. He has left a mission for each one of us, and I pick up on that mission by being an ambassador in my own community, by loving community, by working to develop a strategic agenda in our county that places love first, love for all, and that wishes to that vibrant community where all are valued and thrive. I believe I may have spoken a little too long, but I'm gonna check, what time is it? Let's see. 11.40, and actually we are right on time yeah, if, you, if you're okay with some questions and <laughs> oh, answers. Oh, absolutely. All right. First of all, thank you very much for being here, Commissioner Carter. We appreciate it very much, sharing your stories and experiences and the work you're doing. Um, so we do have time for a couple of questions and answers. Just a reminder that at 12 o'clock, we have the opening, the reception, opening reception for the Black Eye Carlton exhibit, which will be in sales at 12. So we need to, just a few questions now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will bring the mic to you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your um, talk immensely. And um, one of the things I was pondering as you were speaking is that I think the county level is often one that we are a little bit less aware of, or at least I have been, I guess, maybe I should say. And I'm wondering if you can talk about um, kind of the difference you can make at the county level that's unique to that part of government. Thank you very much. I do believe that the county is so unknown and has such a great impact on all of our lives. When I ran as a county commissioner, I found it to be an opportunity, incidentally, as the first African American to be elected to county commissioner in Minnesota. Um, the second was elected about three years ago. But I found it to be an opportunity to help people understand the county's role in our lives. Um, again, this chart is gonna be hard to read, but I break the work down into four areas, and I'll just tell you that the area up top is health and wellness, and that's where I talked about the work that we are doing that engages social services, financial supports, public health. I mentioned that our corrections department is in that area. And you know, that's a lot of work. We also have facilities like a nursing home and a facility for people with disabilities and veterans services in that area. So we are responsible in our health and wellness work team for the supports that people need, for mental health services, for assistance financially. That comes from the federal government through the state but we are responsible for making sure that those financial supports, for example, for people who are seniors and looking to live in a nursing home and, need, and being in need of support through Medicaid, those resources are all approved through the county. And we have caseworkers, social workers who will work with people in that regard. If mental health services are needed, that's in that health and wellness area. By the way, that also involves environmental work that we're doing, such as a facility out in Newport, which creates renewable energy sources, uh, you know, pellets from our trash that are used to create electricity. So there's a wide variety of things just in that area that we do. I mentioned the support of veterans, etc. In the area of safety and justice, you know, corrections, yes, is located in our health and wellness area, and the corrections is support for people who have offended, have seen a judge, and are now on probation 
or in a facility, a short-term residential facility run by the county. So we have the probation officers, we have the short-term facilities like the Ramsey County Correctional Facility we used to have, a boys' totem town, which was for young people. Incidentally, that had about 80% boys of color. Um, when I arrived at Ramsey County in 2005, we had about 200 young people staying almost 200 a day staying in that facility. Currently, we don't have Boys Dome Town. We closed it a couple of years ago. We still need places for young people to stay, and we utilize those facilities in other parts of the state, sometimes even uh, in other parts of the country. But we have developed a number of ways for young people to stay in residential facilities in our own community, and we believe that that is better than a large facility where young people live you know, for six months or longer. We want them in homes, in the community, with family-like settings. And that may be multiple young boys or young girls, but it's important that they're able to get treatment in the community, that they're able to continue their school connections and their family connections. So that's what we're working on here. The other areas are economic growth and community investment, safety and justice, that's where County attorney serves the judges. We support the judges that actually work for the state. We have a sheriff who is a police officer for our suburban community, some of which don't have their own police departments. Emergency management, such as you know, when we have pandemic and things of that sort, helps us to get information to the community along with our public health department or if there are violent uh, outbreaks in our community or floods or things of that sort, we manage all of that. The economic growth and community investment area is that area of planning long-term for our economic vitality. And so whether it's housing or business support or the development of pathways toward work and the support of that, that comes out of our economic area. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> You'll see probably about 30 different departments. And of course, in the information public records area, we're managing taxes, we're managing birth records, and you know all kinds of records and information. You can ask us for data requests, and we have to provide that information. So yes, thank you for asking me to stop on that, and just to share a little bit about what our counties do. Somewhat in the background, unless you're involved, you know, unless you need support for mental health or for a physical disability, or you know, if someone in your home is involved with the justice system. If, in fact, you're involved in environmental education and knowledge, we know a lot about those areas. But typically, that whole comprehensive work that the county does is not as well known and should be. Yes. Commissioner Carter, I'm over yes. here. Such a pleasure to see you again. Um, two quick questions. Uh, one is, what class did you take at Carleton that had the most profound impact on you? And then the second question is, you talked a lot about sort of imposter syndrome uh, when you, you know, came here from Ohio. So I'm wondering, how did you work through imposter syndrome? Well, first I have to ask you, what is imposter syndrome? I'm sorry. Would you please give me that definition? Yeah, sure. So, so feelings of not belonging, feelings of not feeling as if you're, you're at the top of your class, yeah. coming here, and then gotcha. you get here, and everybody's at the top of their class, and you feel like you... I don't think I worked through that, <laughs> actually. I, um, but you're absolutely right. That is, that has certainly had a great impact on me. Let me go back to your first question, which courses did I take, or which course, you said, did I take that had the most influence on me? And I think, I would have to say, it was my French curriculum. I came from, <laughs> I came from a you know, set of enrichment courses in Ohio, where one of the most favorite things I got to do was speak French um, as a part of being an inner city urban young person, that just really 
thrilled me. And I had an instructor in those schools that made it such fun. You told me to this way, my father, that I shall hold so that the sun exists above. You know, these are songs that we learned about impossible things like ants, from long, long ants with hats and stuff like that. But when I came to Carlton, I looked to continue that training. It was a second language, because everyone should have a second language. And I found an instructor, Michel Monod who invested in me. And so it was not just one course, but it was the engagement in the French department, the ability to utilize that as an avenue for international travel, uh, the ability also to continue to think of myself, which I had begun to, as an ambassador in the world, and to know what that meant to be able to translate, to be able to communicate, to be able to understand in different ways. Um, I think one of the reasons I left Carlton was probably because of that imposter syndrome. <laughs> I'm not really sure that I ever really worked through it, and even today, that I ever really feel prepared or ready for the challenges that come my way. But what I did know here at Carlton was that I could, I would, be able to achieve. All I needed to do was work, but I had these nightmares about waking up for finals having slept through the course and therefore failed the final. So maybe that was a part of the imposter syndrome. I actually did well <laughs> at Carleton. Uh, but who I would be, what I was intended to be, how I fit, never quite worked out for me during those years here. And so I would say I probably still felt that. I felt a little different in this all-white environment quite frankly, as a student of color and not knowing where the affirmations were coming from. All of the support that I talked about you know, was important, but really taking that step from an internal African-American environment to being a part of this broader Carlton community was, for me, difficult. And I don't have all the answers, even today. What I do know is that Additional investment in that area of helping our students to know themselves as a part of being comfortable enough with themselves and then as a bridge toward understanding the broader culture and community is needed. Additional investment, I believe, even until this very day. Thank you. Thank you. We do need to conclude. Malheureusement, j'ai des bons points pour dire, mais merci beaucoup pour votre visite. Merci. Uh, I think, uh, but I think we want to have uh, Sharif. Well, thank you all for coming. I think Sharif, you have a brief comment that you wanted to make. Okay. Very, very brief comment to say merci beaucoup pour cette présentation. Vous avez mentionné Michel Monod. J'ai remplacé Michel Monod aussi. So I'm the one who replaced Michel Monod. So I really appreciate that. You mentioned his name and all the good things he, he did for you. And I am the one who today teaches about negritude. Mm. So no, no. <laughs> I was looking for you then. <laughs> well, I was looking for you. Where were you? Well, I came. I came. I guess uh, ten years after you. Oh, so oh, thank again, you. Michelle. I'm that glad that Michelle had introduced that. Thank you. And so I want to say that you are truly an ambassador. And make sure this recording is about the French department, we can have access to that. <laughs> okay? The yeah. second thing also, you are a living library. Mm -hmm. And we need to value our living libraries. Because you, the information you brought, you brought so much to answer questions I've had, you know, because I always heard about that time when Carlton had this vibrant, you know, black community, community of color that, and I happened to meet some of the members who became so successful in different ways. But later, I could only hear caricature about that time. Wow. Yeah. We because, will have to get together more. You see, because I've heard expressions like, oh, the recruiting was like somebody would go stand at a street corner and get black students to call them. No, I've heard that more than that. <laughs> that's a terrible caricature. But I say, I mean, maybe some people came and did not make it. I mean, that's yeah. it's every you know, place, you know? But again, you know, I've also seen so much that come out, came out of that. Mm -hmm. So you've really put a balance on things for me. Uh, thank you very much for that. Merci and uh, merci beaucoup. And also, one last thing, 
the Honorable Mayor, now I can see that he has a connection to Carlton. Absolutely. And that leadership can also be, and mostly you can get it from, from our, our parents. So again, I think you've been a great stepping stone for him. So thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci, merci beaucoup, merci. This concludes today's convocation. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you at sales. Thank you so much. Thank you.